This is Professor Anne Orion Spihar at the University of Alaska Southeast. This is Economic Growth 2, Part 1. We are continuing in our study of the solo growth model. Now, remember the classical model taught us that capital, labor, and technology were the key determinants of the level of production of an economy. And in the previous lesson on the solo growth model, we learned how changes in the savings, and therefore investment, along with population growth, could impact the economy's output. Now we are ready to add one more variable to help explain why and how economies grow over time. This new variable will be technology. The solo model will not explain how or why technology causes growth, Rather, it will be assumed that it does and enter the solo model as an exogenous variable. Technology will take the form of augmenting labor or making labor more productive. We now further the development of the solo model by extending it to incorporate labor augmenting technological progress at an exogenous rate. And once we have completed this model, we will follow it with a discussion on growth empirics, including a discussion on balanced growth, issues of convergence across nations, and growth from factor accumulation and growth from increases in efficiency. After completing this lecture, students will be able to incorporate and analyze the impact of technological progress into the solo growth model explain the circumstances under which nations' growth paths converge, and analyze the empirical data that supports the theory behind the solo growth model. So far we have assumed a constant relationship between capital and labor in the production of goods and services in the solo model. The production technology was held constant. Yet we know that technology can have a profound impact on the production possibility frontier. Technological progress has the capacity to expand the capabilities of producing goods and services. So now we will try to incorporate technology into this model. In the previous lesson, population growth helped us to understand sustained economic growth. In the steady state with population growth, capital per worker and output per worker are constant. However, because labor is growing at rate n, this meant that total capital and total output was also growing at rate n. So population growth in a solo model explains sustained growth, but it did not explain sustained growth in the standard of living because output per worker is constant in the steady state. In the solo model, when technology was held constant, it left unexplained how it is possible that some economies experience sustained growth in the standard of living. Adding technology into the model will address this weakness, as well it should, as we know that data do not support both assumptions of a constant production technology and a constant income per capita in the steady state. In this lesson, technological progress will be added into the SOLA model to address how it is possible that sustained growth and persistently rising living standards occur in modern economies. So adding in technological progress will require a new variable. Let's call it capital E. And it will represent the efficiency of labor, or labor efficiency. And we're going to assume that technological progress takes the form of augmenting labor. That is, it makes labor more efficient and increases labor efficiency at the exogenous rate G. Now, what we mean by this is that technology is going to allow labor, per unit of labor, to produce more output. And our exogenous rate G is going to be equal to the change in E divided by E. So now we write the production function as output is now going to equal a production function that is now a function of k and l times e. Notice that l times e is going to equal the number of effective workers. e, in essence, is going to make labor 
more productive. It's going to augment labor. And notice that increases in labor efficiency will have the same effect on output as increases in the labor force. We would expect technology to make each unit of labor more productive, or in other words, be able to produce more output per unit of labor in much the same way as simply adding more units of labor. Once again, we will disaggregate our variables and transfer them into per capita units. So just as before, little y is going to equal output per effective worker, or capital Y, divided by labor times labor efficiency. And little k, just as before, is going to equal capital divided by labor times labor efficiency. And this variable will represent capital per effective worker. And the production function per effective worker will be equal to y is equal to f of k. Savings and investment per effective worker will be equal to s times y, which is equal to little s times f of k, just as before. Now, it should be mentioned that there's no question that this idea of per effective worker is a little odd and difficult to understand, but don't worry, it's not exactly intuitive. It's merely a mathematical device to help make this model a bit more tractable. Our analysis proceeds just the same as in the last lecture when we considered population growth. Our equation that shows the evolution of k over time now becomes delta k is equal to s f of k, investment, minus our break-even investment equation. The quantity delta plus n plus g all times k. Now because little k is equal to capital K divided by L times e, break-even investment must also change to include g times k, which is needed to provide new capital for the new effective workers. So our break-even investment equation becomes the quantity delta plus n plus g times little k. And it's the amount of investment necessary to keep k constant. And it consists of delta k, which is needed to replace depreciating capital, and k needed to provide capital for new workers, and now gk to provide capital for the new effective workers created by technological progress. Notice that the only thing that's new here compared to our previous model with population growth is that GK is now part of break-even investment. Now notice that since little k is equal to capital K divided by L times E, notice that L times E is going to be a larger value than just L, so little k is going to fall, and capital per effective worker will fall at the rate G. Now we will need investment equal to GK to prevent this fall. Let's consider the graph of the solo model once we've added in technological progress. The equation that appears above the graph is the equation of motion modified to allow for technological progress. And there are minor differences between this and the solo model graph where we considered population growth. Here little k and little y are in per effective worker units rather than per worker units. The break-even investment line is a little bit steeper. At any given value of little k, more investment is needed to keep little k from falling. In particular, g k is needed. Otherwise, technological progress will cause little k, which is equal to big K divided by L times E, to fall at rate G. And this is because E in the denominator is growing at rate G. In the steady state, investment S F of K exactly offsets the reductions in little k attributable to depreciation, population growth, and technological progress. 
With this graph, we can do the same policy experiments as we did when we considered population growth. We can examine the effects of a change in, in the savings or population growth rates, and the analysis would be much the same. The main difference is that in the steady state, income per worker per capita is growing at rate G instead of being constant. This table shows how four key variables behave in the steady state with technological progress. But before we begin, let's remember a lesson that we learned in previous lectures. Remember that if we have two variables and we're dividing these two variables, we can determine its growth rate if we know the growth rates of that which is in the numerator and that which is in the denominator. For example, Consider output per worker. If I happen to know what the growth rate is of capital Y, and I know what the growth rate is of capital L, then I know what the growth rate will be of Y divided by L. It's simply the growth rate of Y minus the growth rate of L. Similarly, for variables that are multiplied together. For example, consider output per worker again. If I know the growth rate of little y, and I know the growth rate of capital E, then I know the growth rate of y times capital E. It's simply the growth rate of little y plus the growth rate of capital E. So let's remember that when we consider how these variables operate in the steady state with technological progress. Now, we now know that capital per effective worker, little k, is constant in the steady state. And we also have learned that the steady state growth rate of capital per effective worker is 0. And because little y is equal to f of k, output per effective worker is also constant, and its steady state growth rate is also 0. Now, these quantities are in per effective worker units, and they are steady in the steady state. And with this information, we can now infer what's happening to other variables that are not expressed in the units per effective worker. For example, consider output per worker, capital Y divided by capital L. This is just equal to little y times capital E. But we know that y is constant in the steady state, and we know that capital E is growing at rate g. So output per worker must also be growing at rate g, that is, 0 plus g in the steady state. 0 plus g because little y is growing at rate 0, and e is growing at rate g. Now, because little y is constant in the steady state, capital E is growing at rate g, and capital L is growing at rate n. So total output grows at rate n plus g in the steady state. We have everything we need now to help explain how it is possible that standards of living increases in a sustained fashion because we've now shown that technological progress can actually lead to sustained growth in output per worker, g in particular, a rate of g. By contrast, a high rate of savings leads to a high rate of growth only until the steady state is reached. And once the economy is in steady state, the rate of growth of output per worker depends only on the rate of technological progress. So what we have just explained is that according to the solar model, only technological progress can explain sustained growth and persistently rising living standards. So now we search for the golden rule level of capital. The golden rule level of capital will now be defined as the steady state that maximizes consumption per effective worker. So to find the golden rule capital stock, we express C star in terms of K star. So C star, consumption at steady state, is equal to the output at steady state, little y star, 
minus investment at steady state. But remember, at the steady state, investment is just equal to break-even investment, the quantity delta plus n plus g times k star. So now we know that c star is equal to output f of k star minus the quantity delta plus n plus g times k star. Now, to maximize consumption at the steady state, we could just take the derivative. And we know that the derivative of the production function f at k star is just equal to the marginal product of capital. And we also know that the derivative of a linear function, delta plus n plus g, times k star is just equal to the constant, delta plus n plus g. Now, to maximize c star, of course, we have to set it equal to zero. And when we do, we find that the marginal product of capital is just equal to delta plus n plus g. Or equivalently, that the marginal product of capital net depreciation is just equal to n plus g. So this tells us that the golden rule level of capital, net marginal product of capital, marginal product of capital minus delta, just equals the rate of growth of total output, which we just found previously is n plus g. Because actual economies experience both population growth and technological progress, we have to use this criteria to evaluate whether they have more or less capital than they would at the golden rule steady state. But in the golden rule steady state, the marginal product of capital net depreciation equals the population growth rate plus the rate of technological progress. And this concludes part one of Economic Growth 2 the solo growth model with technological progress. In part two, we will discuss growth empirics, including a discussion on balanced growth, issues of convergence across nations, and growth from factor accumulation versus increases in efficiency. This is Professor Anne Orion Spihart from the University of Alaska Southeast.